Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the second press conference of today, and we have a media briefing from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on making sense of recent climate change. In taking part in this event, we have Thomas Stocker, who is the co-chair of the Working Group 1 of the IPCC, and he's based at the University of Bern in Switzerland. We have Kasper Plattner, who is the head of technical support unit uh, for the Working Group 1, and he's also based at the University of Bern. We have Johan Marotsky, who is at the Max Planck Institute of Meteorolog Meteorology in Hamburg in Germany, and Miles Allen, who is based at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford in the UK. And I'll now hand over to, to our speakers, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, for coming here to this uh, media briefing. I want to open this uh, media briefing by very quickly um, reminding ourselves what the major messages were out of the physical science spaces, uh, which was the first uh, part of uh, the fifth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Our assessment is uh, basically uh, founded on three pillars, observations, understanding, and the future of climate change. And in each of these pillars, we have carried out a comprehensive assessment based on the scientific literature. Um, that includes the assessment of uh, many, many papers. Uh, Kasper Plotner will go into the details about uh, the size of the assessment. But this is the organizational principle of the 14 chapters that are published in this comprehensive assessment. For the first time, I believe we have uh, um, developed a communication strategy with, which is based uh, around headline statements. Uh, one of these headline statements is that warming of the climate system is unequivocal. It pertains to the observed climate change, but of course making such a headline statement requires that you have all the underlying science available that um, this uh, uh, headline statement is based on. A second equally accessible and concise statement concerns the understanding of climate change. We say human influence on the climate system is clear. A third one is a statement that encompasses the projection of climate change and relates that to the policy relevant uh, information that we can extract from the climate model simulation. We state that limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. Now the power of these headline statements is not only their simplicity and accessibility for the user and the wider public, but it's the simple fact that they are part of the summary for policymakers, and therefore they have been accepted and adopted, in fact, after a line-by-line -line procedure, uh, in our case back in September 2013 in Stockholm, by all the participating governments. So what you read here has been accepted by all governments of the world. Our projections based on uh, over uh, 40 different model uh, uh, types that were used in simulations uh, that were coordinated uh, in preparation of uh, this assessment and produced over two petabytes of data. We have extracted information regarding changes in temperature around the world and changes in precipitation around the world. We present these results in the form of scenarios and in a very simplified way I depict this here by um, comparing a world in which aggressive mitigation is happening in the 21st century. I call that a two degree world and a world which follows a business as usual scenario, the so-called RCP 8.5, which end up, ends up in a world which shows a warming that is, in global mean, more than 4.5 degrees Celsius. You see, in both cases, we're talking about a world that is fundamentally different from today. 
but for 4.5 degrees you see temperature changes in certain areas in excess of 7 degrees Celsius in the high latitudes of the northern hemisphere and significant precip precipitation changes which are associated with the changes uh, around the world uh, on the order of 30 to 40 percent. It is the combination of these changes which uh, uh, exerts pressure on human and ecosystems, issues that are assessed by the second working group. By presenting these different scenarios and the physical changes that are um, uh, determined from the model simulations, we also implicitly uh, indicate to the users that we do have a choice, a choice between a scenario of limiting climate change to two degrees or a choice um, of uh, following a business as usual scenario, which would result in a world that is fundamentally different from today. Today, we do have that choice. That choice, obviously, is a choice that uh, needs to be um, uh, uh, discussed and negotiated uh, at the levels of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Let me allow a last word on, on outreach and uh, um, uh, material that has been prepared uh, to communicate uh, our findings and the uh, heavy load of work that has car been carried out by the scientists. We have uh, the summary for policymakers in the six UN translations, including all the figures, everything translated, readily accessible on the web. We have fact sheets, uh, question and answer sheets on the process, but also uh, summarizing the headline statements in a concise form, printing the material that uh, is contained in 1,500 pages on just two pages. We have a DVD that is free of charge, distributed, uh, uh, which contains all the PDF materials, including the supplementary material. And we've also produced uh, brief summary volumes that only contain the summary for policymakers, the technical summary, and the frequently asked questions. Finally, we have standardized uh, generic PowerPoint presentations that can be used for authors and scientists uh, to extract information and distribute it. And we also have produced a short video explaining the major results out of that assessment. Thank you very much. I now hand over to Kasper Plotner, who will uh, give you some more details about the process of how we, we arrive at uh, this comprehensive assessment. Thank you, Thomas. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello. I would like to highlight a few um, aspects which are required to actually come up with the assessment and the key conclusions that Thomas Stocker just presented, which are the result of the five-year um, um, work by the, by the scientists. But what is actually important to remember is what is unique about IPCC reports and what the scientists are being asked by the governments to perform. And they are asked to do an assessment of the scientific literature to provide reports on climate change issues that are policy relevant but not policy prescriptive. So if you read these uh, headline statements from the Working Group 1 report, you need to bear in mind that they cannot be policy prescriptive in, in any way. Same applies to Working Group 2 and Working Group 3. They need to be scientifically, technically robust. They need to be balanced. So we need to look at all the evidence from all angles uh, available in the scientific literature. And we need to present and represent uncertainties in, a, in, a, in an open and transparent way. And one part that is of special importance is the question about the literature sources that are being used in IPCC reports. And for working group one, and for all working groups, it's clear that we have to assess all available scientific technical literature. There is sometimes an issue with to what extent we can use non-English literature, just because of uh, the uh, language capacity of, uh, capacities of authors. So we are somewhat limited to to a, a large part of the English literature and other literature doesn't really find its way into the assessment, um, uh, which could be improved. In working group one, priority is clearly given to peer-reviewed literature. We've uh, assessed or include uh, over 9,000 uh, scientific studies are being cited in the report and 97% or more of these are actually peer-reviewed studies. Emphasis is placed on the assurance, assurance of the quality of all the literature cited. So the fact that the paper or a, a, a study is peer-reviewed itself does not 
warrant a citation in an IPCC report. It's really the task of the authors to look at all the evidence and all the papers and then make their own quality assessment of that um, study. All the sources uh, may provide essential information, uh, in particular for adaptation mitigation measures, more regional, um, international and national reports, which might not have been peer reviewed, are much more relevant for working groups two and working group three in their assessment work. And of course, uh, an extra responsibility, which is a huge uh, burden and huge respons responsibility for the author teams is to ensure the quality and the validity of the source uh, during the entire process uh, that they perform the assessment. I'd like to quickly also highlight the uh, five or six year uh, long development process of the Working Group 1 report and in particular highlight this close link or the dialogue between the science community, the lead authors and, and the governments. It's important to stress that the governments are the IPCC and they have multiple ways how they can how they can interact with the science in a laying out what they would like to see represented in the report, in the scoping of the outline, in the nomination of the experts, and then also as part of the review process, this multi-step review process where the governments have multiple possibilities to provide comments, expert comments on the text. And in the end, the approval of the ESPN and the acceptance of the report. During that process, the dialogue is very active. Uh, we had about 38 governments who provided um, uh, comments during the review process, and many more were actually taking part in the approval process. An important part here is to stress that while the SPM is line by line approved and there is some negotiation about wording uh, during the SPM, this is not the case for the underlying report, neither for the chapters nor for the technical summary. So the authority of the science in the report that is reflected in the chapters and the technical summary and in the SPM lies with the authors of the report. Uh, I'd like to conclude with giving those people who have been performed the task for working group one a proper credit. This is the author team of working group one of have one out of four lead author meetings and provide you with some numbers. We had 209 lead authors, 50 review editors from 39 countries. But here again, this is a small group out of a much larger group that uh, was working in the scientific community, 600 contributing authors or more uh, have added their expertise and provided input figures, text to the Working Group 1 report. We have 14 chapters, <coughs> one atlas of climate projections, six annexes, 1,552 pages, over 1 million words, and overall, including the atlas and the electronic supplements to the atlas, we have over 1,250 scientific graphics. As I said before, over 9,200 publications have been assessed and are actually cited, um, assessed probably even more, and over 2 million gigabytes of numerical data have been used from uh, multi-model into, compa into comparison uh, projects as part of the assessment. And finally, the multi-stage review process has led to over 54,000 review comments by over 1,000 experts and 38 governments in the three formal rounds of reviews. And each of these review comments uh, receives a written response by the authors. So um, the review comments will, are publicly available and the responses by the authors to these review comments are also publicly available on the website that Thomas has pointed out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kasper. I'd like to now give the opportunity to Jochen Morotzke, please. Yeah, thank you. Well, I want to uh, pick up on one um, particular scientific issue that has uh, gotten a lot of attention recently and that we deal with in the report, uh, this so-called warming hiatus, a warping, warming pause of the surface over the past 15 years, and in, in Chapter 9, the Evaluation of Climate Models chapter of the AR5, we're dealing with that. So what's the issue? Um, shown here is a global uh, surface temperature, um, both from the observations, uh, that's the curves in blacks from three different data sets, and all the colors are from simulations, and shown are deviations from the, the time mean of the um, 
of the reference period uh, from 1961 through 1990. And uh, by and large, what we see is that uh, the warming over the 20th century, in particular the warming over the second half of the century, is well simulated by the models. But if you look at the, uh, at the end of the record, you see that compared to the black curves, the colored ones are running high. So uh, the black one seems to flatten off the observations, but the, the model warming keeps going. And so uh, there, there has been a, a huge public debate uh, about uh, what is going on here, both with the black curve, why has it flattened uh, somewhat, and why do the models keep warming? And uh, one of the important things one needs to mention here is that we're looking at the surface temperature. So the temperature of a very thin layer of the climate system and uh, climate change, anthropogenic climate change has continued. Uh, it's just not so visible in the surface anymore, but it's extremely clearly visible if you look at the energy, at the heat stored in the ocean, which has kept going during these 15 years. Uh, so uh, climate change is continuing, even though uh, the surface warming has slowed down uh, quite a bit. Now this is a bit of a maybe an abstract graph, but uh, it leads us into uh, to a, uh, an element of explanation I want to give, and I, maybe I should warn that uh, the explanation for this phenomenon is not entirely straightforward and simple. So so we have to embark on a on a bit of an adventure here. Um, so w what we've shown is we have. 114 simulations of the historical climate uh, in, in the last exercise of uh, global climate modeling. And shown here is the warming over these 15 years uh, in all the 114 models, and we just count. It's a simple counting. How often do we find which degree of warming uh, in, in our 114 simulations? That's, a, that's these gray bars. And they show that um, most of the, uh, of the majority of the models have a warming of around 0.2 degrees uh, per decade over that 15-year period. And um, sorry. And shown in red is the uh, these are the observations, including the uncertainties. And so we see that over the last 15 years, it makes the point quantitative than made before qualitatively, that almost all the models show a stronger warming than the observations over those 15 years. Uh, and we can we can make that uh, quantitative, and I'll come back to the numbers of the 114 simulations. 111 show a higher warming. So that normally every every kind of statistical test would say the models are not consistent with the observation. So you might be forgiven for thinking there's something wrong with the models. However, uh, we, we got to be careful. Uh, I think it's fair to say, and that is in part what emerged after the AR5, that this warming hiatus, uh, I think, characterized as an extreme climate event. Uh, extreme in two senses of the meaning, uh, two, uh, two meanings of the word. One is a number of factors have conspired to produce cooling, all natural factors. The sun has gotten weaker, it's a little bit weaker over that period. We went through the downward phase of the 11-year solar cycle. There have been some volcanic eruptions which tended to cool. But we also saw, uh, and I'm afraid there's a wrong, it's, we saw an, an extreme 20, the 30 is wrong here, a 20-year trend of the trade winds over the Pacific. Uh, this has been an, a unique strengthening of the trade winds of the Pacific over this period, and it has been shown that this strengthening of the trade winds has led to a surface cooling. That surface cooling is in particular there in the, in the equatorial eastern Pacific, and then it has also been shown that if the equatorial eastern Pacific cools, the whole, uh, much of the world will cool as well. And also, uh, this is coming out uh, of a very recent work that we uh, we had some extreme cooling over Eurasia, in particular in northern winter, um, during the same period. So we have the sun, we have the volcanoes, we have the trade winds, we have Eurasia cooling, and all happened at the same time. So that coincidence of some extreme events, some not so extreme events, but still happening at the same time, uh, qualifies for an extreme event. And when you have an extreme event, it's very hard for a model to reproduce it. And let me illustrate that with uh, an example, how easy it is to miss simulating an extreme event. Uh, let's look at a well-known example at the pseudo-observations. You toss two, di two dice and you throw a two, two ones. So that's my observation. And now I take models, another pair of dice, and try to reproduce this event. 
So I'm getting a number of things, and well, no one is surprised to see. Well, this is a model that has. Uh, this is a climate center that has several models. You won't be surprised, of course, that by and large, I fail to reproduce this event. And actually, I fail 35 out of 36 times. I will have a larger number than this observation, which is about 3%, which is just about the, the fraction of the models that reproduced the hiatus over that particular period. Now, of course, you would say, don't be silly. Um, you just gave us uh, an extreme event. You gave us a minimum possible of the die. So how can you expect to get a high hit rate if you reproduce? And I say, well, of course, you're right. I need to repeat the observations. I have to do that, uh, that comparison repeatedly. And likewise, I have to do that comparison against observations, against the models repeatedly. And what that means is, if I compare 15 year temperature trends observed against simulated, simulated, I cannot just take this one period, the last 15 years, and do that comparison, not if that period was an extreme event, but I have to make that comparison for all 15 year periods available to me. It's just like throwing the dice a hundred times and then seeing does another pair of dice reproduce that and then I might say something about the quality of this other pair of dice. It is that comparison that we did here uh, we do the, all the 15 year trends so for, for that we have over the over the 20th century and the circles are the observations and the shading is just how many of the models reproduce uh, a, a trend of that magnitude and basically, you can say, where are the circles relative to that shading? And if the circles are above, then the observations are higher than the models. If they are below, they are lower. And you can see the models can be all over the place relative to the observations, depending on when we look. So there's really nothing wrong with the models. It just happens that last period, the hiatus period, is the very last circle. It just happens to be an extreme state, extreme event. So... Uh, the hiatus is an extreme event. Uh, the implication is we can't expect more to reproduce it, at least not easily. And, of course, the global climate change continues, as you can see from the ocean heat uptake that goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jochen. You see here a very nice example of a, a topic that has uh, been assessed by IPCC, but... The science goes on. The science continues, and there are many scientists now that look at this uh, interesting phase of the past 15 years in terms of temperature, but also in terms of many other quantities in the climate system. And with that, I want to hand over to Miles Allen to tell us about the role of climate change in recent weather extreme, wet, recent extreme weather. Another example where um, firm routing in the IPCC assessment then leads to continued research. Please, Miles. Yes, well, this is also talking about uh, extreme events, um, but uh, much closer to home, at least much closer to my home. Um, we are uh, somewhat obsessed in Oxford by uh, the risk of flooding in the Thames Valley, um, and uh, particularly those of us who live in the Thames Valley. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to report to you the results of our uh, experiment, which is uh, which we, we are announcing today um, at, at this at this press conference, the results of our, our, our assessment of the role of climate change in the uh, 2014 uh, UK floods. Um, this is work, of course, which I've done nothing of. Uh, the people who've actually worked, done the work are, 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 are listed. Some of them are listed here, but there are in fact uh, many thousand more, some 60,000 more, who I'll mention at the end. <coughs> um, and this work, of course, is supported by a number of institutions and a couple of projects, notably the Euclea um, EU project, um, which is looking at, uh, across Europe, in engaging a large number of uh, institutions in looking at the attribution of individual uh, weather events and their impacts uh, to external drivers of climate change. So first of all, what, what happened? Uh, back in January, we had double the normal monthly rainfall. Um, the, the time series there at the top from the Met Office shows it was a, uh, a very uh, extreme outlier in the context of 20th century rainfall and the the green map there shows the extent of flooding in the Thames Valley Oxford is over on the on the the right of that 
Um, and uh, but as you can see, uh, it's not an entirely parochial uh, talk here. Did this this effect? This event did affect uh, most of southern UK, as you can see from that dark blue shading um, over that that map of the UK. So obviously, this raised a lot of uh, uh, questions at the time. What was the role of climate change in this? It's important to stress. It's not just you. You might say. Um, seeing an event of this magnitude in a hundred-year record, well, you know, eventually that's going to happen. But perhaps even more interesting, um, and what was much less widely reported at the time, um, was that this is this was in fact a, a one in two hundred and fifty-year event, because it was the wettest January and also the wettest winter in the world's longest daily weather record, which is maintained uh, by the University of Oxford. Um, you can see here um, the. Uh, the, the records, which we still have in the School of Geography, February 1767, that's the beginning of the record. That was not a particularly wet month. Um, those are the, the records taken at, at the time. Um, here is Ian Ashpole uh, making history at the end of this most recent winter. Um, here we are celebrating the most uh, the wettest January. Some people criticised us a little bit for breaking open the champagne when everybody else was underwater, but um, it's not often that a weather record is broken that has stood since men were wearing tights. Um, so I think it was worth it was worth noting. Um, so so it was obviously an extreme event, and this led to a lot of uh, debate about what the potential role of climate change was in this event. In fact, this debate became particularly heated when our Prime Minister David Cameron um, said in Parliament that he suspected a link between the fl floods and climate change, and this uh, really set the cat among the pigeons. Um, and set many climate scientists' phones ringing off the hook um, to, 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 to get comments on this. Um, at the time, I said, given the information we had available, um, that's pretty much what I'd have said. Um, suspect a link, not particularly, uh, not, not particularly uh, definitive, um, cautious, but there were sort of good physical reasons for believing that climate change uh, and the warming induced by rising greenhouse gases might be playing a role in increased flood risk in mid-latitudes. Plenty of studies assessed in the most recent IPCC uh, report, which suggested that extreme rainfall in mid-latitudes is rising as a consequence of human influence on climate, although that was one of the conclusions to which we had to assign a medium confidence because um, the, both the, the physics involved is complex and also the observational records uh, of these particularly higher frequency extreme uh, weather events are, are less good than the long-term mean. But what could we say about this particular event in, in, uh, in, in I itself? So, so this is a, an experiment we, we did, um, uh, designed uh, similarly to, to one which was published a, few, a couple of years ago, uh, led by Party Paul, looking at the floods of autumn 2000. Um, Pardeep's uh, study uh, took 10 years, um, and so as you can see, the, the, it, was, it was focusing on uh, Autumn 2000, uh, published in 2011, um, and it's a testament to the fact this study was led by a, a Swiss postdoc, uh, that it's been completed in two months. Um, that probably says something about the nationalities involved and the efficiencies of people involved. Um, but uh, I, should, I should also mention the, the Natalie Schaller and, and Friedrich Otto, a German postdoc who basically led this. Uh, maybe it's also because it was led by women, actually. That might be another point. Um, anyway, but so, so you, you can spot all the differences here. But this is the, crucially what we've done. We, we took a global uh, atmosphere model um, with a nested regional model, uh, drove it with uh, conditions in the world as it was, and then modified conditions to simulate the world as it might have been if we had not caused human-induced climate change. And the the, we were essentially rolling Joachim's dice many, many times in order to assess whether the introduction of anthropogenic influence had loaded the dice towards the particular floods that we saw. And because we suspected it was going to be a relatively subtle effect, we knew we were going to have to roll the dice a lot of times. Um, if you're going to see a small loading, slightly too many double sixes, you need you need a, a, a large ensemble. In fact, the sample, the ensembles we're seeing here, we've only you know this is this is barely enough to to to, to see what was going on. Are uh, um, around forty thousand simulations in total. Uh, these, as I say, were only possible because uh, they were performed by members of the public. Um, doing uh, using volunteer computing uh, on the under the climateprediction.net project. Um, so um, that's what the public got. Um, they got a global model, and uh, then they got an embedded regional model. That's showing the European region we were covering here, the UK pretty much in the centre of it, 
Um, and each member of the public uh, performed a simulation of either the world as it was or the world as it might have been. So several of them performed many simulations for us um, and returned their results to our service for analysis. So the result, um, this, the blue uh, curve, the blue dots here, each dot corresponds to a simulation returned by a member of the public. The blue dots show the world as it was, and the green dots show the world as it might have been. And the first thing you'll see is, well, they're pretty similar. It's a pretty subtle. If there's any signal at all, it's a subtle one. I and mean, that's the correct conclusion. But let's just zoom in on the region of interest, this region between sort of uh, 50 and 100 year risk events. And you can see, if we zoom in, you can see a separation with the blue, the dark blue line moving to the left. That is an increase in risk relative to the uh, dark green line, which is the world as it might have been. And the uh, shading there shows the 5 to 95% confidence intervals based on a statistic uh, bootstrapping uh, algorithm, which shows that you know, the result is statistically significant. Um, in fact, if we just look at results over that uh, 50 to 100 year return period, um, uh, Time scale, range of timescales, we find that, uh, and that the histogram shows you pretty much the distribution of results over that time frame, time frame, we find that the risk of a very wet winter has increased due to human influence on climate by around 25% in the framework of this model-based study, which of course makes considerable use of observations, but it still of course makes use of models as well. So that's the bottom line on our conclusion. That's a, a and I would say, I'm still agreeing, unusually, perhaps, with um, uh, the UK Prime Minister um, in that, you know, there is some role, um, and, but that's a, 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 rel a relatively modest uh, increase in risk, um, and I think that's a, a realistic assessment at, at this time of the role of climate change in these UK floods. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miles, and uh, one may add to say that the risk has shown one direction of development, and that direction also indicates the direction of the next few decades under global warming. I think that's an important message as well. Yes, thank you. That, that's a good point to make. Yes, it's, it's moving in one direction. Okay. Let me then uh, make a few final remarks uh, to close uh, our presentations. And I want to uh, briefly uh, uh, talk about where we stand now with these assessments. Uh, Scientists have completed their homework that was given to them four years ago. They have worked extremely hard, uh, only they have completed it in this assessment, obviously not uh, in general. Um, we have implemented a proactive communication strategy. I've explained that a little bit. And the information, uh, it's not uh, uh, enough that we can mention that, is policy relevant, but never policy prescriptive. If you really look very carefully at the formulations in the summary for policymakers, this is very obvious. Let me take a, a brief look ahead. Um, my personal impression, and that is shared by many, uh, is that the scientists have really experienced the limits of the task. They have experienced the limits of what they can bear during such a comprehensive assessment. I think these comprehensive assessments become unmanageable uh, if there is not significant assistance ex extended to the scientists. Now, why is this so? Climate science is a very successful science carried out by many hundreds and thousands of scientists. They are producing a lot of material and for a comprehensive assessment, you have to assess increasing numbers of uh, publications, increasing numbers of model simulations, and that's just a task and a burden that is continuously increasing uh, with time. That's basically also reflected in the size of the assessments, starting from the first assessment, 1990, to now this fifth assessment that we're talking about, 2013-2014. I think uh, it's important to uh, uh, stress that the scientific information continues to provide an essential common ground for climate negotiations. I think it is that quality of information that provides a, a basis for discussions, a basis for negotiations. And I'm very happy to report that uh, many of our insights, uh, even some of the headlines, made it directly 
into documents of the negotiations at the level of the United Nations Framework Convention on climate change. So IPCC and with that all the scientists who have contributed, who have been in leading positions uh, like coordinating lead authors, lead authors, but many, many hundreds also who have contributed as contributing authors uh, deserve uh, our uh, recognition here and our uh, deepest uh, thanks for what has been accomplished here in this fifth assessment cycle. So thank you very much and we are now all available to respond to your questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, Ros Pidcock from Carbon Brief. Um, thank you for great presentations, uh, really, really great. Um, I just want to pick up on something that uh, you just said there, Thomas. Um, and also jumping ahead perhaps to the title of uh, the session this afternoon, which is Lessons Learned, at least part of the title. So I guess um, now is the time to be reflecting on this report, um, but also looking ahead to future ones, um, as you said. And I wondered if the panel, anyone on the panel, um, might be able to uh, just offer their own recommendations, perhaps practical recommendations, uh, for how the IPCC and its processes can... Uh, make sure it evolves with the times, if you like, um, and stays relevant. Well, let me uh, just start uh, with a few points and then open the floor for, uh, for our uh, colleagues here. Um, as I said, I think a, a comprehensive assessment is an important uh, contribution to climate negotiations because they provide a snapshot of what the science can say. Because in this time of the world, uh, there are many sources of uh, various, di various information, uh, information that may have or have not an agenda, information of various quality. And I think it's this very uh, lengthy but carefully designed process of IPCC of carrying out its assessment that makes it distinct from all other sources of uh, information. So I think that is a point that we would like to preserve, that uh, we, I deeply am convinced that this is providing uh, a, a relevant uh, a basis for uh, any negotiations. What we also saw is that um, the communication uh, can be elevated to a, a higher, more effective level using these headline statements. And uh, Working Group 1 here has made, uh, I think, the first step uh, in, a, in a rather uh, logical way to uh, distill uh, in one more step uh, from the summary for policymakers the policy-relevant information and the policy-relevant messages. And finally, I think uh, what we have seen in our assessment and uh, that has not yet been mentioned, but uh, Working Group 1 has also produced an atlas of global and regional climate change, basically a jumping board for further assessments that look much more deeply into regional climate change. Uh, and there are many, many open questions, as we have seen when it comes to uh, regional changes in extreme events, but also impacts on human and ecosystems uh, for which we need to know the physical information. And uh, I think that could be a model how uh, we uh, address future assessments by placing more emphasis on these uh, issues that uh, are based on the information in a, in a very fine-grained way from, from the physical science basis. But uh, I'd like to invite uh, my colleagues yeah, um, here to add to that. Maybe I should say, so, so I was a coordinating lead author of uh, one of the chapters on the, I, I think over the four years, uh, I, I spent about one quarter of my working time, so one full year uh, on, on, on the AR5, and, and it has been extremely exciting and intellectually very rewarding. Uh, so I really enjoyed that time despite the workload. And I should also say that I'm absolutely convinced that uh, the IPCC process is effective in the sense it does deliver what it's supposed to deliver, which is comprehensive and uh, reliable information. The thing that makes me doubt a bit about the future is I do not believe that the process is efficient and that is uh, I don't think it delivers at acceptable cost, especially time cost, but also the cost to the science what it should deliver. 
And the reason why I say that is um, at the end of the day, it's summer for policymakers, which is uh, which is delivering the, the policy advice. Now, the summary for policymakers is 1% of the total report. And so we had to distill the 11, uh, 1,100,000 words into uh, 14,000 words in two stages. And if you look at what made it into summary for policymakers and what did not, uh, it's not just the detail we left out, but there were whole large blocks of topics that were left out, had to be left out, totally clear. But then you ask yourself, why are we doing this all-encompassing assessment of so many topics, most of which we knew when we started would not make it into the SPM? And I don't believe that this is an efficient process, and I believe this has to be made more efficient. Otherwise, the risk is that an ever larger fraction of climate science is gobbled up by the IPCC process. And I think we have to we have to do something. I believe the, uh, the, the assessment needs to continue. I think we are, climate science has to support this assessment, has to support the government and the public in this process. But I think we have to find a way of making it more efficient. Thank you. Miles, you want to add something? Yes, I would certainly strongly agree with what uh, Joachim's just said and also highlight that the kind of direction of, of interest in climate science is in some way um, working uh, to make it, to, to reinforce the point that Joachim's just made in that increasingly, I, I used the analogy in my, my talk in, in the session this morning that the sort of big headline statements in the summary for policymakers of IPCC reports are increasingly reminiscent of a statement like the Earth moves around the sun in 1700. If somebody could prove that the Earth didn't move around the sun in 1700, that would, of course, have been really important. So the statement doesn't become unimportant, but it, it sort of ceases to become a, 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 a focus of, of science, and, and the science sort of moves on to details about how different planets move and so forth. And that's very much how climate science is moving. We are moving that the interest is well, for me at least, but I think also for many other climate scientists, is moving from that global scale attribution statement to statements about what can be said about flooding in the Thames Valley. And it's not clear that a, a global scale incident governmental assessment is the right forum to discuss the consequences of climate change for the Thames Valley. And <clears throat> that's where I think we need... Um, in, in many ways, going forward in IPCC, we need some kind of subsidiarity principle, uh, which I think is a, a one way of putting what Joachim was describing. If something doesn't need to be in the summary for policy, if a topic doesn't need to be in the summary for policymakers of an international assessment, then perhaps it shouldn't be on the IPCC's agenda and perhaps it should be better considered by a regional assessment um, or a, a focused assessment on a particular, a particular sector or a particular region. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of very important climate science which cannot go into the summary of policymakers of an IPCC assessment. It's very important to recognise that, to encourage that science and to avoid the impression that if it doesn't get into the summary for policymakers of the IPCC, it's somehow less important. Um, but, but yet, we have to, you know, so we, we have to find that balance between maintaining those important international assessments and, uh, and keeping that uh, progress towards regional detail. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, Christina Reed with Climate Wire, and this question is for Miles. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about what um, the man-made climate change, how it was represented in the experiment, um, and and why you would get different um, results based on that? Um, sure. Um, it was it represented very simply. Um, obviously, we can change atmospheric composition uh, back to the way it would have been without um, human influence on climate. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but in addition, we modify the surface temperatures using the estimated signal of human influence on climate based on the uh, individual members of the CMIP-5 model ensemble. So we used all the different models. And in fact, on one of my figures, there were lots of little dots which correspond to individual models. And we did indeed find that there was a sensitivity of the pattern of the, of the size of the signal we found to which model you used to subtract the pattern of human-induced warming, which suggests that so you could, you could get a, a change in that relative risk 
um, according to which model you focused on, uh, which, which model you chose to believe out of the CMIP ensemble. Um, that, that shows that we need more local regional detail in order to understand precisely how the, the um, uh, human influence is, is affecting uh, uh, something like the UK, UK floods. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. I have a question from Twitter, um, from Samuel Illingworth. And the question is, does the panel think that key aspects of the most recent IPCC report should be taught in universities and schools? Uh, yes, I believe I think that precisely. Uh, that is why, for example, we have also included in every chapter uh, two or three frequently asked questions. They have been now published uh, in a summary volume. This is precisely material that should interest also teachers uh, where um, uh, many topics that uh, the public uh, is interested are phrased in terms of questions and the responses are then provided in uh, hopefully almost jargon-free language illustrated with a few pertinent uh, figures and diagrams for the use of uh, education. If I may add to this, actually, for the entire report and including the summaries, all the figures that have been produced are publicly available on the website. So you can either use the high resolution figures from the web or if you want to um, have the PDF or uh, other formats, they are available from the technical support unit. So if somebody has an interest in using those in teaching, uh, they are available and they can contact the technical support unit. Are there any other questions? Hi, um, this is a question for Miles um, about the climate prediction that um, flooding experiments. Um, so did you say that it, this is the first time you're presenting that result of, of the chances of a very wet winter increasing by 25%? Uh, yes, that, that's, that's out, that result's out today. Out today. Um, and when two months, it's still, you take your hats off to this team. <laughs> <they've>, <laughs> <laughs> um, my question, I guess, is that, uh, it, so that involved many thousands of members of the public, as you said, um, from a climate science communication engagement point of view, that's fantastic. But um, I'm guessing that wasn't the uh, perhaps primary motivation for that. I'm just wondering if you can explain perhaps the computer power that's involved in doing those sorts of simulations and why, just essentially why that was necessary. Why can you not do that at Oxford? <laughs> uh, well, to put simply to, to run a 40,000 member ensemble um, of this type, you would need a supercomputer with that sort of number of reasonably high powered cores. Um, I think Joachim probably has such a thing actually. Will next year. Okay, um, but uh, but we don't in Oxford because you know he's richer than me. Um, so so to, to, partly it's a resource thing, but also it's an it's an efficiency thing. It's it's much more efficient if you can distribute a a, a, a task in that way. It's a much better way of doing it. Um, and uh, um, but it, it's it's important to stress this is the first quantitative assessment of the role of climate change in the uh, autumn two thousand floods. I very much hope it won't be the last. Um, I know the UK Met Office is looking at precisely this question using um, much higher resolution models um, so they can complement our sort of large ensemble nested resolution design with a smaller ensemble inevitably but much higher resolution um, in order to understand what's going on. And I think you, you need to take several approaches to this. I'm not suggesting that ours is, is the only one, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a relatively simple one and, and gets you a number out. And we are in fact hoping uh, over the next couple of years to develop this further such that we can get the numbers out in near real time uh, because we think it, while it's sort of moderately interesting now, uh, people have very short memories and people have kind of already forgotten these floods uh, in the UK. It's, oh, yeah, something happened last, last winter, yeah, whatever. Um, and uh, so I think if we, if we had been able to make this assessment at the time in order to put some numbers on the Prime Minister's um, suspecting a link, I think that would have been really helpful. So we are working towards that with, with our partners at the at the Met Office and others as well. Thank you. I do actually have another question. I'm sorry to just dominate this, uh, the questions. Um, it was to Joachim, actually. Uh, so Nature Climate Change recently ran a, a special edition looking at 
communication to the public and and the media um, about the service warming slowdown. Um, and in there, there was quite a lot of soul searching, if you like, from scientists um, about perhaps what could have been done better. Um, I just wondered if you might have an opinion on that, whether you think climate scientists could have done a better job in explaining at, in the early stages why uh, it doesn't mean that global warming has stopped, um, and if so, how? I, th I think we could have done something better, although probably in a different way than, uh, than was portrayed there, which I felt was a bit of armchair quarterbacking happening. Uh, and I think those of us who do those climate scientists, of us climate scientists who do the communication with the public from an active scientist point of view, we know how hard it is to get something thrown into the discussion. And maybe, maybe I can try my own presentation today, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm um, permitted to say that Thomas was afraid this was too complicated. I, mean, I guess that's a fair statement. I said, you may be right, but I still need to try because uh, this is about spontaneous climate variability, uh, which is a, an abstract concept, which I would say for years and years and years in the climate change debate, we tried to downplay because it's complicated. It's a noise. We're interested in the sigma, in the man-made warming, but climate fluctuates spontaneously, and that gets in the way so dreadfully that we try to filter it out and to knock it down until it's not visible anymore. Make makes a simple story. And what happened here with the hiatus, that which is so strongly influenced by forced but also spontaneous uh, climate variability, if we don't take the uh, that internal variability, the spontaneous variability head on, we couldn't possibly explain anything. And uh, so in that sense, I think our attempt at simplifying in the past has come back to haunt us. And so if I were to take away any lesson, it is this, uh, that we have to, to uh, resist the desire to simplify at all cost. Uh, thinking that there may be a long-term cost if you simplify too much. Now, of course, it's incredibly difficult to say what level of complexity do you have to take into your discourse. And uh, we all know that. We try to explain something we feel is important. And the journalist or member of the public says, now, come on, uh, take, take your scientist hat off and think of what we can communicate. And uh, you've got to make it simpler. Otherwise, you cannot present it. What do we do? In the past, I think, we erred on the side of simplicity. And this is one thing I would say we could have done better. Whether with the knowledge of seven, eight years ago, we could have done it then is very much questionable. But in hindsight, now I'm doing the armchair quarterbacking myself. In <laughs> hindsight, I don't think the communication strategy about internal variability was very effective. Thank you. I believe we have time for one more short question, if anyone has any. Uh, and if not, you are welcome to approach our panelists. I believe you have about 10, 15 minutes before your next engagement. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you ver for the very interesting presentations. And thank you for taking on the enormous task of compiling this report. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you all at the next press conference, which is in about 20 minutes and is on um, the new face of the moon, science and exploration. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, and thank you for the efficient organization by yourself. Thank you. Thank you all.